Collected Tales of a Dublin Doctor. This podcast is a series of tales written by my father, Patrick Bofin, and rediscovered in a file at the back of a press 30 years after his passing. He's worried about the Mazzy. Friday, May 17th, 1974, was a beautiful day. The Mayfly was up on Loch Con, and I was looking forward to a basket of trout. However, few of the many people crowding the streets of Dublin had thoughts of trout fishing. They were concerned with the more immediate prospect of the weekend with forecasts of bright sunny weather. The city street traders had done brisk business in fruit, salads and tomatoes. A weekend of picnics and trips to the seaside was anticipated. New summer dresses and light blouses had been bought. Many of the young women had had their hair done. At 5.30pm, the streets were crammed with people hurrying home from work. Talbot Street and Nassau Street were particularly packed as the crowds converged on the suburban trains at Amiens Street and Westland Road stations. Suddenly, and simultaneously... Car bombs were detonated in each of these streets, with the horrifying results that many of us remember. Hundreds of people were injured, and 25 died. Immediately, the major disaster plan for Dublin was set in action. Ambulances, motor cars, and in Talbot Street, a CIE bus ferried people from the explosion scenes to hospital. The dead were removed to the city morgue. The immediate problem in major disaster is the identification of those killed or grievously injured. In this particular incident, many had sustained very serious injuries from blast or shrapnel, which made identification difficult. I stayed in the coroner's office adjacent to the city morgue from 5.45pm that evening with a team from the Gardaí. We worked slowly, painstakingly interviewing relatives and witnessing the identification of bodies, as this became possible either by visual identification or by examination of clothing, jewellery or other possessions. It was a slow process, attended by grievous distress. The evening wore on into night. All were now identified except for the bodies of one young woman and two babies. The crowds coming to the city more grew less and less until by 1am, It was finally quiet. Only one Garda inspector and I remained. We were tired as we drank our coffee. In the stillness, we heard a noise in the hall. There, standing on the tiled floor of this cold, high-ceilinged hall, were three men. In the middle was an old man with drooping head and sunken shoulders, his arms slightly bent at the sides. His eyes were dull and his mouth slack. His waistcoat was undone and his shirt was ruffled up from his trousers. Supporting him on either side were his sons, two big middle-aged men. The concern on their faces and the gentleness with which they held his arms was touching. One of them spoke. He's worried about the Mazzy. She never came home tonight. Was she caught in the bombs? I asked the question I'd asked so often that night. Do you know what clothes she was wearing? He nodded slowly, and in a detail one would not have expected from a man of his years, he described all she had worn. I realised very soon that the remaining adult body could not be that of his wife. I told him that wherever she was, I could assure him that she had not been killed by the explosions, that she might have stayed with friends and could come home later. I pointed out how disrupted the city was following the bombing traffic diversions, people afraid to go on the streets, and so on. As I talked, a transformation occurred in the little old man. He straightened up and shook off the supporting hands of his two big sons. He buttoned his waistcoat, 
raised his head and threw back his shoulders. He was once again a proud man with dignity and authority, the father of his house, the leader of the clan. He smiled slightly, his eyes twinkled, and he leaned towards me, and in a soft voice intended for me alone he whispered, Isn't she great? The old flower has escaped again.